Thank you very much. This is, uh, this is my very first time uh, at the University of Minnesota Rochester. It's uh, very nice to be on campus. I have a family connection uh, to Rochester going back to 1939 when my mother was in nurses training at St. Mary's Hospital and was part of the nursing team that attended uh, to, to uh, William Mayo uh, during uh, Dr. Will, he was known here, uh, as he was known here, uh, uh, during his final illness. My, um, my uh, interest in, in stem cell research derives from uh, a book that I, pub that I published with my co-author Leo Furt, head of, the laboratory, head of laboratory medicine and pathology where I work in the University of Minnesota Medical School. And uh, uh, it's, it's basically meant as an effort for public education. Uh, bear in mind that I, that I am not a scientist. I work in the communications field in, the, in, uh, in laboratory medicine and pathology at the University of Minnesota Medical School. So what I've learned about stem cells is it comes from that book and from being uh, a member of the Public Education Committee of the International Society for Stem Cell Research back when we were writing the book. Uh, also, uh, it, it's, uh, I think, fair to note that uh, my, I've, I've followed developments in the field since, although my primary focus was the first, uh, on stem cell research was the first decade of this century when we published the book. Uh, the book was published in, uh, in 2008, second edition, 2011. Upon publication, uh, C-SPAN did a nice uh, uh, program uh, on our book. We did some readings at the University of Minnesota Bookstore, and if you're interested, you can go to uh, cspan.org and type in the stem cell dilemma, and uh, you'll, you'll find us there. The highlight uh, of my, uh, well, at least certainly one of them, of, the, of this exercise, for me, was to return to Seoul, South Korea. I had served in the military there for some many years before for uh, a keynote talk I gave at Stem Cells Asia in, in 2010. So uh, with that, I'd like to get started. One of the nice things about being a generalist rather than a specialist is that you can roam around. Specialists have to sort of stay focused. But as, a, but as a generalist, I can talk about a lot of uh, different aspects of uh, stem cell research. Not only the, uh, the excitement of the research itself and the potential for therapies, but also uh, the bioethics that are involved. Human reproduction is in there. Uh, also, uh, uh, the new uh, genomics technologies, innovation in the biosciences uh, in general. Uh, and last but not least, stem cells in microgravity, stem cells in space, and that comes toward the end. Stem cells, what they, what they are and what diseases they can or could treat. Let's go back to 1998. There was quite a lot of, of um, news media attention when James Thompson, a develop, developmental biologist at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, first isolated uh, human embryonic stem cells. Uh, he did this uh, by, uh, uh, w uh, with a, uh, a uh, donated embryo from a fertility clinic with using private funds because federal funds were not available for this kind of research. What Thompson did, or what he did, he probably did, although no, I don't know exactly what he did, but what researchers in general do in order to uh, to, um, uh, to put uh, embryonic stem cells in, uh, in culture is to remove the intercell mass of a days-old blastocyst, a, a fertilized uh, egg, several days old, that that's, uh, has a, approximately to, uh, 200 uh, cells in, in uh, the inner mass of the blastocyst. They are removed and they are put in <laughs> cell culture with a feeder layer. Again, this was done for the first time in 1998. And uh, in that feeder layer, these cells will, uh, they basically thrive, and they, will, they are essentially immortal cells in, as long as they, are, they have access to that nutritional source. Now, there's a, been quite a lot of excitement, uh, certainly in the first decade of the 20th century, uh, um, with uh, the uh, 
the isolation of embryonic stem cells because of the possibilities that they could treat so many different diseases uh, and chronic diseases, including many diseases of the elderly. Uh, and the, uh, the interest in the, in the field really exploded at that time, the first decade. And I'd like to remind you that my, my uh, attention in the field was essentially from 2003, 2003 to, to 2010, 2011, the second edition of the book that's being circulated now uh, ar around uh, was in 2011. So many different diseases potentially could be treated. The field is called regenerative medicine. Stem cell is the key technology for regenerative medicine. And back in 2002, the National Academy and the National Research Council did an analysis of, of uh, how many people, how many people could be treated with uh, this, this technology. Now this number, is, uh, it always impressed me as being quite large. Uh, we're talking about 130 million if you actually just do a st straight addition. Uh, and in fact, um, there are many pe people in there who, would, could be, who are double counted, if you will. Uh, and not all of these people are potential uh, or patients, potential uh, uh, beneficiaries of this, uh, of this um, uh, advance in medicine. But, there were, but the numbers are still quite, uh, quite strong. A brief video that explains what stem cells are, but better than I have. Good afternoon, sir. Josh Arnold, Stem Cell News. Uh, I just want to ask a quick question. Do you know where stem cells come from? Well, they come from babies, right? What is a stem cell? The term stem cell is really quite broad, and there are many different types of stem cells. The type of stem cell that has received the most attention in recent years is the embryonic stem cell. Embryonic stem cells were first discovered and isolated in mice, and it took scientists another 17 years to identify similar cells in humans. Since that time, many scientists have been studying embryonic stem cells to better understand how normal human development takes place. And there's been much speculation about the potential of embryonic stem cells for curing human diseases. During normal human development, after an egg is fertilized, it begins to replicate, forming a small cluster of cells known as morula. Several rounds of cell division result in an early embryonic structure called a blastocyst, containing roughly 64 to 200 cells, most of which form the walls of a small sphere. Inside this small sphere is a group of cells known as the inner cell mass. It is these inner cell mast cells that can be isolated and grown in a tissue culture dish as what we call embryonic stem cells. But what makes embryonic stem cells so special? We define a stem cell by its two most unique features, self-renewal and pluripotency. Self-renewal refers to the ability of one stem cell to generate more stem cells indefinitely. The other feature, pluripotency, is perhaps the most exciting feature of a stem cell. This means that stem cells are capable of becoming any cell type within the body. Unlike your heart cells or your brain cells, that are destined to be heart or brain cells until they die, stem cells, and especially embryonic stem cells, have the potential to become gut cells, brain cells, heart cells, or any other cell type in your body. This process of becoming a certain cell type is known as differentiation. In a developing embryo, Self-renewal and pluripotency are critical for the formation of a viable organism. In the tissue culture dish, self-renewal and pluripotency are the features that we study and exploit when using stem cells to understand normal development and as we think about using stem cells to treat disease. I just wanted to ask you a basic question about stem cells. Okay. Um, can you tell me what they're used for? Uh, uh, the clone sheep and humans and stuff? Do I look like a scientist? Why are stem cells important? There are three main purposes to using and studying stem cells in the lab. The first is to understand normal development. By studying the development of individual cells without the complexity of an entire embryo, researchers can ask and answer the most basic questions about the requirements for and processes that take place during normal human development. The second purpose is to understand disease. For example, Improper function of neural cells can result in brain diseases such as Parkinson's and Alzheimer's. It is difficult to study these human diseases in animal models, 
but the diseases can be modeled at a cellular level in neural cells grown from stem cells, allowing scientists to study the disease process in a controlled environment rather than in the complex surrounding of the brain. The third purpose of using and studying stem cells is for drug discovery and regenerative medicine. This is considered the future of stem cell biology. Researchers envision that once diseases are carefully modeled and studied using stem cells, drug therapies could be designed, tailored, and tested for their effectiveness at curing a variety of ailments on the exact disease cells they are meant to treat. Uh, can you just tell me what you know about stem cells? Um, I don't know, I think they cure everything. Stem cells may hold this potential, but what is the ideal stem cell to use for curing diseases? So, so the question people often raise is, what is the ideal cell type that should be used for regenerative medicine? And if you think about the things that one would want, you want a cell to be able to be introduced into a patient and be incorporated into the appropriate organ that you're trying to repair. Uh, and you want this to become a widely acceptable practice. And so that requires that you want to start with a cell that can turn into any of the 200 and 12 different cell types of the human body. And so that's what we call a pluripotent stem cell that has the capacity to turn into anything. So that's certainly one thing that we like in the, the ideal uh, stem cell. The second thing is that uh, just like organ transplants, there's a concern that if you introduced foreign cells into a patient, that the body would recognize those as different and reject them uh, using their immune system. And so a cell that was genetically identical to the patient that we're trying to, to treat would be ideal. And the third thing that we would obviously love to have in the ideal stem cell uh, is that it be widely acceptable to the public for use. And this gets to the issue of the um, vigorous ethical debate that has ensued over the last uh, 10 years regarding embryonic stem cells and the issue of having to destroy a five-day-old fertilized egg, essentially, uh, or an embryo in order to make human embryonic stem cell. Is there a stem cell type that meets all the criteria of an ideal stem cell? So the recent discovery of uh, what are known as induced pluripotent stem cells, or sometimes called IPS cells, uh, may in fact address many of these considerations uh, regarding the ideal stem cell. Generation of these cells does not require creation of a human embryo. Because we can go directly from an adult skin cell to a stem cell that's pluripotent, it essentially bypasses both the creation of a human embryo and bypasses the ethical issues uh, that have raised so much concern uh, in this country and around the world. There are many steps that have to occur before that would be available for the public as therapies, and those include uh, being able to turn these cells efficiently into the cell type desired for the repairs, uh, finding ways to introduce them properly into patients and having them get incorporated uh, into the organ of choice, uh, and, uh, and then doing so safely uh, and making sure that these cells don't do things that we don't want them to do after they're introduced, like making tumors or going to places and turning into things that we don't want them to turn into. And so the, the scientific field is uh, aggressively tackling all of these uh, hurdles. And I'm confident that uh, over the next decade, we will have addressed many of these things. So. As you think about almost every disease of the human body, there's potential for stem cell-based therapies to address those and alleviate human suffering. It's only going to happen if we have really creative, bright people who commit themselves to this mission and train themselves to be in a position to ask the questions and answer them over the next several decades. And we'll be relying on the next generation of scientists and physicians to carry this vision out over the next several decades. Okay, Dr. Shriyavastava was kind enough to lend uh, us one of his illustrations that's, that's the, that, uh, that represents the cover of the second edition of our book, The Stem Cell Dilemma, that, that I've uh, passed around. He also mentioned these, uh, this, these IPS cells, induced pluripotent stem cells, which basically circumvent the whole uh, ethical issue of using cell lines derived from human embryos. Uh, in, the, in the fall of 2007, as we were uh, 
as we were finalizing our galley proofs for the first edition of the stem cell dilemma, there was this breakthrough was announced uh, that uh, Shinya Yamanaka in, at the Ricken Institute in Japan and James Thompson at, in Ma at Madison had, found, had, had figured out a way to reprogram adult differentiated cells, mature cells, let's say from skin, reprogram, reprogram them genetically to become embryo-like, embryonic-like, pluripotent stem cells. Uh, this was a remarkable uh, discovery for which uh, uh, Yamanaka won the Nobel Prize in, uh, to, in uh, 2012. Uh, at, and uh, again, uh, this was thought to be to initiate a medical revolution. What it's done is transform uh, the field of biology, d developmental biology, the medical revolution is hopefully still to come. These things take a long time. But the notion of being able to take adult cells from various differentiated tissues in the body, add s several genes, and find that they are able to, to return to an embryonic-like pluripotent state was just a, it was just a, a was just mind-boggling. Now, uh, iPS cells are used today uh, to, they have a great potential for therapies, but right now uh, the focus is on using them to model diseases uh, and to, to, to test drugs. For example, a, a patient with a, with a disease like, let's say, Parkinson's, which is uh, uh, a, a serious neurological disease uh, that in, in which the, uh, uh, a certain cell type uh, in the midbrain uh, begins to fail, begins to pr fails to produce the, the neurotransmitter dopamine. Uh, the idea then is to take uh, uh, iPS cells, induced pluripotent stem cells, and use what we know about uh, uh, sending uh, cells down a certain differentiation pathway toward a certain tissue, creating then dopaminergic uh, cells that produce dopamine, and and uh, being able then to to uh, to um, use those cells first, of course, in in animals, then in human trials to see if Parkinson's can can be uh, 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 treated in that manner, and that's true of many different uh, disease types. Uh, here's an example of, uh, of what, you know, a, a nice visual of what induced pluripotent stem cells uh, can, can do. Uh, this is uh, from my a colleague, Tim Camp, at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. He sent me quite a number of years ago now, basically taking adult cells uh, and reprogram reprogramming them uh, to become cardiomyocytes, or heart and muscle cells. So adult cells sent, sent down this differenti differentiation pathway. Actually, there's a company here in Rochester that uh, produces uh, uh, induced pluripotent stem cells and, uh, and uh, does things like this. Of course, it's a nice trick, but actually making it work in patients is, is, the, is the tremendous challenge. Okay, so pluripotent stem cells. From embryos, we've had uh, since 1998, since James Thompson's isolation of human em embryonic stem cells. Uh, what about pluripotent stem cells, whether embry human embryonic stem cells or these iPS cells in, uh, in clinical trials? With, there are some uh, that are just beginning. They're in clinical phase one, phase two, so very early in clinical trials. We have... Uh, uh, um, we have an example of, uh, for the treatment of, of uh, macular degeneration, which is a, uh, a disease of the eye, particularly in the elderly, that can cause blindness. Uh, there have been some patients with visions whose vision has been, uh, if not entirely restored, improved uh, with, uh, with these uh, uh, pluripotent stem cells. We have another example in Parkinson's, which I just mentioned. That is happening, sp spinal cord injury diabetes pa using pancreatic islet beta progenitor cells in myocardial infarction or heart attack and using uh, cardiomyocytes from pluripotent stem cells, either human embryonic stem cells or 
these IPS cells I've just mentioned. Now, this is a slide I'm going to spend a little time on because I want to mention, I want to talk a little bit about clinical trials. We can have wonderful things that happen in the laboratory, but if we don't get through clinical trials, they never, they never benefit patients. And this is a huge challenge, huge, uh, for, uh, for regenerative medicine. Uh, we write in our book, which is being circulated, the, the, bio, bio, the biologist's imagination, innovation in the biosciences, clinical trials constitute nearly 60% of total drug development costs. To, uh, they're up six, to 260% from 30% in 1980 by one estimate. So clinical trials, that's, where, that's what's costing uh, so much. Uh, and that's true not just of, of drugs, uh, but it's certainly true of... Um, of cell therapies and regenerative medicine, which are treated like drugs by the FDA. All right, so phase one clinical trials, researchers test a new drug or treatment in a small group of people for the first time to evaluate safety. Phase two, the drug or treatment is given to a larger group of people to see if it is effective. Phase three, the drug or treatment is given to larger groups of people to confirm effectiveness. And then the drug is either approved or rejected by the FDA Phase four, study is done after the drug or treatment has been marketed to gather information on the drug's effects in various populations and any side effects associated uh, with, with its long-term use. This is from the NIH website. If you go to uh, clinicaltrials.gov, which it was set up by Congress uh, in the, um, around 2000, uh, you, and you type in stem cells, you'll get more than 6,000 or close to 6,000 results. Most of the registered clinical trials involve hem hematopoietic stem cells. These are stem cells from, from, uh, from the bone marrow, from peripheral blood, from cord blood. Uh, and of course, this, this area of, of transplantation of, of cells has been quite, quite important and quite effective. Uh, there are several hundred uh, clinical trials involving uh, multipotent mesenchymal uh, stem cells. Uh, from stromal tissues uh, found in, in, uh, in many organs, uh, bone marrow included, or adipose tissue, fat, which is a ready source for mesenchymal stem cells, and uh, placenta and other tissues. And these, can, these uh, mesenchymal multipotent, not pluripotent, but multipotent stem cells uh, can be used potentially for treating cardiovascular, musculoskeletal, central nervous system, and other uh, uh, kidney diseases also. Uh, and, and we do have uh, a significant number of mesenchymal stem cells in clinical trials, uh, I think several hundred. Um, and we have some neural stem cells in trials for neurological diseases, such as Parkinson's. There are comparatively few, however, uh, pluripotent stem cells in clinical trials at this point. Uh, the FDA has, proved, has approved just one stem cell therapy that was in in 2011 for commercial use. And this is an umbilical cord blood uh, product called Hemocord, which is used to restore nor, uh, low blood counts to normal lever levels in, in patients with low blood counts. All right, this is an important uh, uh, point here. Uh, since uh, with the, with the uh, isolation of uh, human embryonic stem cells in 1998, there were any number of startup, commercial startups to see whether uh, this, uh, this technology could be brought to, uh, to, to the clinic uh, to, to help that along. Uh, the, uh, nearly all the uh, st pioneering startups uh, of the uh, first decade of uh, pluripotent stem cell research, or stem cell research in general, have, uh, have either disappeared or have been purchased, the assets have been purchased by uh, China, Japan, companies in China, Japan, Australia in some cases. The problem is uh, that, the, that the stem cell uh, clinical trials, uh, they, they enter phase one or phase two what are in, a, in what are called open label studies in which the researchers and participants know which treatment is being administered and this is, an, this is called, it's considered the valley of death for stem cell therapies uh, because funders, funders, supporters, d decide whether to pr proceed to phase, to, to phase three trials uh, only after convincing and compelling data is produced from phase two, and that simply has not happened. 
at least up to this point, there's some signs that things are turning, but uh, uh, it's, as of now, it takes 15 to 20 years to, uh, um, uh, to translate from the laboratory to the clinic, perhaps even longer since we really don't know uh, what the fate of those early stem cell startups is ultimately going to be, uh, and millions of, hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars. Uh, a new pathway um, uh, for regenerative medicine therapies has been established recently in Japan so that uh, products may enter the, the marketplace with provisional approval uh, following phase two studies uh, if, they sh if these studies show some efficacy. Well, even if you, uh, if you get through clinical trials, you can't get to clinical trials unless you have a way of scaling up cells uh, from the laboratory. You uh, ha basically, cell we're talking about cellular manufacturing. And uh, uh, this, is a, this is a huge challenge as well. So to get to clinical trials, you've got to scale up from the laboratory. This requires specialized manufacturing facilities. Uh, we have one at the university. The, uh, the uh, Molecular and Cellular Therapeutics Facility on the St. Paul campus that is directed by my colleague Dave McKenna. There is one here, the, the Mayo Human Cellular Therapy Laboratory here in Rochester. These are CGMP, or good manufacturing, current good manufacturing facilities, and they are, their, their job is to standardize and to purify uh, cells and to uh, grow them in sufficient quantities that they, they can be used in clinical trials. Uh, so this, it is a major undertaking. We're going to go back briefly to uh, cloning. So the year before Thompson's discovery, uh, you may recall Dolly the sheep and, the, and the, the cloning controversy surrounding Dolly the sheep. And when people talk about Stem cells, human embryonic stem cells, cloning always seems to figure in, uh, in that discussion. Uh, what is it? Well, essentially, it is, it is it like IPS with the genetic factors inserted into the nucleus, reprogramming an adult cell to become a, uh, a pluripotent cell. Uh, in this case, cloning, and we're, we're talking about cloning. The cl Dolly was the first mammal that was cloned. So it was a huge challenge to do that. Essentially, you're removing a nucleus from an adult egg, you're taking, excuse me, from an adult cell, uh, and you're taking an egg from another uh, animal, uh, uh, and you then remove this, the, you remove the nucleus, insert the nucleus of the, uh, of the first animal into the egg of the second animal. The egg reprograms the nucleus, uh, and with a ele little electrical stimulation, cells begin to divide uh, a uh, embryo, in the case, if you want to build, if you want to grow a, a cloned mammal, the, em, the embryo then is, is uh, taken from the petri dish and implanted into the uh, surrogate uh, to produce the animal. Now, in, in stem cell research, of course, no full organism is, is of interest. The, what, what is of interest are those em, uh, embryonic stem cells. So th this is another way to create embryonic stem cells. It's called research or therapeutic cloning. Okay, I'm going to switch a little bit to, the, to an area where I made a contribution, and that is to stem cell policy. Again, this is the, uh, thinking of the first decade of this century when uh, stem cells was, were in the news a lot. In 2003, I thought it would be a good idea uh, to, um, because, because it was come, the whole field seemed to be coming on strong from a poly, policy perspective, to create a global map and then to see what, other, what countries would do uh, one after the other. This, is, this particular version of the map that I created is from about 10 years ago. Uh, and you'll see uh, countries in, in the yellow, which, are, which have no uh, policy on human embryonic stem cell research. You'll see some countries in lighter brown, which have a policy whereby uh, donations from fertility clinics could be used for, for research for human embryonic stem cell research, and countries in darker brown in which uh, not only could IVF uh, donations be made for research, but research cloning was also permitted to create 
human embryonic stem cells. Uh, so uh, this was a, uh, the, 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 the dots are genome sequencing centers around the world. Uh, sometimes people think, well, that's a separate area of science. It's really not, and, which, and it's coming together uh, uh, more every day. All right, so in 2003, I, in 2003, I started with, uh, with these countries um, uh, uh, having, uh, I went out on the internet, basically, and found what their policies are. And, uh, and then, once I started, uh, uh, what happened is that people began to notice, and legislative bodies uh, in different countries, parliamentary bodies, bioethics commissions, contacted me and said, look, this is a, this is a, um, where, here's a, here's a law we just passed, or here's a report that you might be interested in. They would send me that, and I would, I would make adjustments to the map. Uh, so, so uh, this, this was a quite an interesting exercise. Uh, this, the, this global map really reflects the interplay of culture, religion, uh, interest in medical therapies and scientific prestige, economic uh, competitiveness, a whole host of things. This particular uh, version of the map, as you'll see in a moment, was used uh, in a, during a debate on the, uh, on the uh, Stem Cell Research Enhancement Act of 2007 on the floor of the U.S. Senate uh, by, by Senator Jeff Bingaman, who with his colleague Lamar Alexander of Tennessee, uh, they were the co co-chairs of the science uh, caucus uh, in the Senate. So uh, my map had made it around. In this case, the, uh, uh, again, yellow, no policy, uh, um, gray, restrictive policy, light brown, IVF donations allowed for, for uh, human embryonic stem cell research, and uh, the darker brown, IVF allowed, but also research cloning. Um, so this, this was a, 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 quite an interesting exercise, and I, I just sort of kept doing it, and uh, people would go to the map, they would see where, where different countries stood, and there would be links to all the, do the relevant documents and legislatures and parliaments uh, uh, and bioethics groups around the world, uh, and they're all a little different. But my thought, my thought was then that this, that, you know, it shouldn't be just focused on a certain number of countries because you know, this really involves everybody. And the map was used uh, and published in major scientific journals, newspapers, in this case, the Financial Times. Um, uh, in, that, in this period, President Bush, who had uh, restricted uh, fun federal funding for uh, human embryonic stem cell research to a uh, certain number of cell lines from embryos as as he put it, that had already been destroyed, but no further destruction of human embryos or der derivation of stem cell lines from destroyed human embryos that would be supported, research that would be supported uh, by federal funds. Now, Congress uh, in 2006 and 2007 passed the Stem Cell Enhancement Act, Stem Cell Research Enhancement Act, and uh, uh, President Bush vetoed uh, that legislation both times. Mr. President. A senator from New Mexico. Uh, Mr. President, I yield myself uh, five minutes from the time uh, that's uh, reserved on Senator Harkin's uh, side. Without objection, senators recognized for five minutes. Uh, Mr. President, uh, I rise in favor of S S5, the Stem Cell Enhancement Bill of 2007. Many of my colleagues have eloquently stated uh, reasons for supporting this bill over the past two days. Uh, the passage of this bill would be an important step forward for research into treatments for devastating diseases. In addition, passing S-5 will help the U.S. as a leader in biomedical research, a leader in transparent and ethical research practices, and a leader in developing safe, effective treatments for diseases. I want to see stem cell therapies developed in this country so that we can ensure the safety and availability of these treatments for American families and at the same time create jobs for highly skilled workers to do the necessary research and to develop these new treatments. Our current policy 
puts us at a severe disadvantage to other countries. As the director of the NIH said in a recent hearing, our current stem cell policy is like working with one hand tied behind our backs. Scientists in most other countries are at an advantage to U.S. scientists because they are allowed to study the best stem cell lines and do so with government funding. Let me uh, explain this uh, world stem cell policies map that I've put up here, Mr. President. It, it is color-coded to show the different stem cell policies that exist in different parts of the world. And we've, we've essentially chosen four colors, so four categories of policies that I'm trying to, uh, to focus on here. First, we have the countries in yellow which have not adopted stem cell policies. And you can see those, those uh, countries are, are fairly extensive. Uh, next to those uh, <clears throat> are those that have adopted stem cell policies. The U.S. Is, is part of that group. Those are the countries in gray on this world map. Uh, the U.S. is among the most restrictive of those countries that are in gray, but we do have other countries that uh, have, have policies that are in that category uh, as well. Third are the countries in light brown. Uh, which allow the creation of stem cell lines from leftover embryos in IVF clinics. And you can see those uh, light brown uh, countries. Uh, passing S5 would move the United States into that group of countries uh, with other countries uh, such as France and Canada and Brazil. And the final group of countries that's depicted on this world map are those that are shaded in dark brown. Uh, they allow other laboratory techniques uh, to be used to create embryonic stem cell lines. You'll notice that many of these countries have very strong scientific research programs, and I would particularly mention the United Kingdom, India, and China as part of that. Scientists in these other countries, other than the U.S., are free to use the type of stem cells that are best suited to their research, whether they're adult stem cells or embryonic stem cells created before 2001 or embryonic stem cells created after 2001. In fact, many countries have been promoting stem cell research because they see this as an opportunity to get ahead in this field during a time when U.S. scientists are restricted to less useful stem cell lines. For example, the United Kingdom has established a world stem cell bank to collect, characterize, and distribute embryonic stem cell lines to researchers around the world. <clears throat> the United Kingdom's also developed a comprehensive national regulatory system that requires researchers to follow strict ethical guidelines. While these regulations may slow research to some extent, embryonic research is an area that merits extra care and transparency and oversight. We should not relinquish our duty to uphold high ethical research standards to other countries or to individual states within this country or to the market more generally. Uh, Mr. President, I'd ask uh, an additional two minutes. Oh, without objection, the Senator is recognized for additional two minutes. Uh, many other countries, including Singapore, Korea, and Australia, also have federally funded centers for embryonic stem cells. However, it will be difficult for the United States to capitalize on the research advances that are made in those other countries since federally funded scientists in the United States are restricted from collaborating with foreign scientists who used the stem cell lines that were generated after 2001. Furthermore, we can't leave this important field of science to the private sector alone. We have a long history in this country of bipartisan support for basic science research in this country precisely because it does not make financial sense for industries to invest substantially in early stage research. Any scientist will tell you that human embryonic stem cell research is still in its early stages and that it has gone more slowly than it would have otherwise gone because of the restrictions currently in place in our own policy. 
Furthermore, most cell-based therapies, including bone marrow stem cell transplants, were first developed in academic research hospitals and have never been widely utilized. This means that federal funding is even more important for stem cell or for cell-based therapies like stem cell transplants than it is for other types of treatments. Mr. President, I urge my colleagues to support S5. It is an important step to keep the United States a world leader in the field of biomedical research, and it will give hope to many of our citizens for the treatments that they desperately need. Mr. President, I uh, yield the floor. Okay. Since, uh, since our book was published in 2011, uh, and in our book we, d we did note uh, medical tourism, stem cell tourism, that is to say uh, patients uh, going to uh, unregulated clinics for treatment, typically uh, in Me Mexico or in Barbados, Bermuda, China, Eastern Europe, any number of places. Uh, what's happened since, and this is something I just basically learned about, is the explosion of unlicensed, unregulated stem cell clinics in the U.S. Uh, this map put together by uh, uh, Leigh Turner and Paul Neffler. Uh, Leigh is, uh, is in the Center of Bioethics at the university. He and I uh, conferred about this recently. Um, uh, his, his, uh, his concern right now is that any effort that the FDA may have, in, have, have had in mind uh, will probably no longer come into play with the, the deregulation ethos uh, of the new administration. I guess we'll have to wait and see about that. Uh, but Dr. Oz is definitely against it, against these clinics. <clears throat> okay, uh, you, it's, it's difficult to separate uh, human embryonic stem cell research from its origins in, uh, that I'll discuss now. Uh, all right, Leonardo da Vinci uh, uh, le uh, leads off each of the six chapters in the stem cell dilemma. He was, after all, a very famous anatomist uh, uh, in addition to be a, ge a genius in so many other spheres. Uh, and uh, anatomy is really the beginning of modern medicine. And tale of two women, Louise Brown on the left, the, f uh, the first test tube baby born in July 1978, her mother and Dr. Robert Edwards, Nobel laureate. And on the right, Baroness Mary Warnock, more on her in a moment. And of course, the next generation, Louise is, is holding um, her son, Cameron. And I'm not neutral on this subject. I have a nephew that's, that's, uh, that came into the world via IVF, and he is the essence of perfection. All right, the Warnock Report. Mary Warnock was a philosopher at Oxford, and uh, she led the effort to, to, uh, to study what it meant to actually, to actually have human embryos as re potential research subjects ex vivo or outside the body. This, this, sort of, this began uh, in that era. Uh, so Louise, Louise Brown is born in 1978. 85, the, uh, this, the Warnock Report is published in Great Britain. Uh, in 1990, Parliament establishes the Human Fertilization Embryology Authority. Uh, that basically centralizes everything there, makes everyone accountable, public and private sphere, to this, uh, to this uh, uh, authority. And in 2002, the HFEA issues the first licenses for human embryonic stem cell research in Britain from surplus embryos at IVF clinics. Okay, in the U.S., quite a different story. Uh, 1981, Elizabeth Jordan Carr, his first test tube baby is born, but because of congressional concern over Roe v. Wade, uh, basically this whole area has been left to the private sector, and there are very few, if any, regulations. There are, as of 2003, perhaps 400,000 uh, uh, embryos on, in liquid nitrogen in fertility clinics across the U.S. In 2004, uh, President Bush's uh, Council on Bioethics under Leon Cass issued a uh, report calling for regulation of, assi of uh, assisted uh, reproduction. Uh, it, was, it went nowhere. And in 2009, uh, octuplets were born. So we have a situation in this country that's quite different from, let's say, what, uh, what has occurred in the UK. Uh, in the UK, research is permitted with, uh, with the approval of the authority. 
uh, on, on early embryos up to 14 days when the nervous system uh, begins to appear. Pre-implantation genetic diagnosis it was, uh, is related. It was developed in the late 1990s. Uh, and in this pr procedure, IVF embryos are uh, screened for genetic defects in, in, uh, when the donors have, are at high risk for producing children with serious uh, health uh, issues, uh, genetic uh, uh, defects, uh, genetic diseases. Uh, at the eight stage, uh, uh, at the eight cell stage, Morula, it's possible to pluck uh, a cell, screen it, and that the seven remaining cells will produce a normal, healthy individual. And of course, the, uh, the, the key here is not only it's a screen of, for the genetic disease, but also for the uh, uh, for um, uh, hi tissue compatibility. All right, very quickly here. This uh, is a nice little uh, video to explain what, sa what Save Your Siblings are all about. Andy Trevino took to his new baby sister, yeah, Sophia, yeah, from the start. And in more ways than one, she took to him. One of the reasons Sophia was conceived was to save her brother's life. Shortly after Andy's birth, he got sick, very sick. His immune system just didn't seem to be working. He started having very rare infections, infections of his central nervous system, infections of his uh, stomach, infections of his lungs. The Trevinos were desperate for a diagnosis, which they weren't able to get in Mexico City where they lived. They wound up at the Children's Hospital in Boston and learned that Andy had a rare genetic mutation called NEMO that was causing his immune system to fail. We decided to keep, keep him safe with antibiotics and a lot of medicines, about 13 different types of medications, and then to try to find a compatible donor for a bone marrow stem cell transplant. But they couldn't find oh one. Goodness, one day, on? one of the physicians came to our hospital room and told us there's always the option of having another baby. And after birth, we could use the umbilical cord stem cells for Andy. And that's what you did? That's what we did. It wasn't difficult for me to take this decision because we always wanted another child. And to know that this other child was going to be able to save my son's life, it, it, it was exciting. IVF, in vitro fertilization, was the only way to create an embryo that would be free of the genetic mutation that Paulina carried. It took 36 embryos to get a big enough selection to achieve success. There was no way to cure Andy without the decision of the family to have another child whose cells matched Andy's. And indeed, by performing in vitro fertilization and selecting for the tissue type, they were able to have a child whose bone marrow could cure Andy. And now Andy is well, and he has two sisters, Andy Sophia, no and most recently, nine-month-old Tanya. The family lives outside of Boston, where Andres has a job with Children's Hospital. The Trevinos are Catholic. The Catholic Church believes that life begins at conception that creating embryos through in vitro fertilization, which is what the Trevinos did, is wrong. Richard Dorflinger with the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops believes that each embryo deserves respect. We're talking here about life, about uh, a human life at a very, very early and undeveloped stage, but uh, human life nonetheless. Dr. Daly disputes that an embryo in this stage is a human life. We're talking about the first three or four days after conception, when the human embryo is a tiny ball of cells, between 50 and 200 cells. It's a speck smaller than the period at the end of a sentence. You need a microscope to see it. The church also believes the destruction of embryos to obtain embryonic stem cells for research is immoral. When we're talking about stem cell research, we're talking about a way to uh, destroy that life, cut it off at a certain stage for the benefit of others. Uh, we think that's uh, wrong to do that. But Louis Genin, professor of ethics at Harvard Medical School, 
says that the research is not only not wrong, it would be wrong not to do it. It's a biological fact that those embryos outside of a womb can't mature beyond about two weeks. Knowing that, we have to take account for moral purposes of the duty of beneficence, the duty to come to the aid of those who suffer if we can do so without unreasonable burden. In a document called Dignitas Personae, issued by the Vatican in 2008, the Church reiterated its existing ban on IVF and on the destruction of embryos for stem cell research, which is not to say that there are not individual Catholics like the Trevinos who choose not to follow the Church's teachings. Dr. George Daly directs stem cell research at Children's Hospital in Boston and is a leader in the field. Stem cells are part of what we call regenerative medicine because stem cells are involved in the natural repair and regeneration of our tissues. They teach us an enormous amount about the disease process, but they give us this possibility for regenerating tissues. And that's why they're of such tremendous scientific importance, but also potential medical value in the future. Because of that, the Trevinos decided to donate their remaining embryos to Dr. Daly's lab. This decision that we took saved the life of my son. It gave us a beautiful daughter, actually two beautiful daughters, and it allowed us to hopefully help other people with these cells that uh, have been created at the lab. We succeeded in generating two embryonic stem cell lines one of which carries the precise gene defect that affects Andy. That line is enormously valuable to us. But Catholics and others who think the research is immoral favor using adult yeah. stem cells. You're going to be splitting Dr. These Daly two studies two adult yeah. stem cells, yeah. but believes the use of embryonic stem cells is crucial. If we want to understand the earliest stages of human development, how we lay down all the different tissues, then we're best to study these early embryonic or pluripotent stem cells. Now that the Obama administration has allowed federal funding for embryonic stem cell research, there are many more stem cell lines available. But scientists are still barred from using embryos to create new stem cell lines with federal funding. And there's a pipeline of hundreds of lines waiting for approval. So, the policy is in place, but it's going to take months, maybe a year or more, to implement it. So there's still a certain delay and frustration. As long as some people believe that an early stage embryo is a human being, the moral battle over embryonic stem cell research will continue. Meanwhile, Andy Trevino has benefited from stem cell therapy, and others with his disease will benefit from the stem cell lines donated by his parents. For Religion and Ethics News Weekly, I'm Betty Rollin in Sudbury, Massachusetts. Okay, if you think it's getting complex, it's getting actually even more complex. Uh, there is a new technology called genome editing, uh, uh, in which uh, technology that uh, actually a, a, um, a process and kind of an, an immune system in bacteria has been commandeered by human beings, to make precise genetic changes. Uh, by that precise, precise, I mean letter by letter. And so that genes, uh, so individual sequences can be changed, genes can be uh, changed, genes can be, uh, can be geared up to, to express at higher levels, and so on. Uh, this technology could be used uh, uh, in um, not only for somatic tissues, but, but germline tissues. And just last month, the uh, National Academies released a consensus report that, quote, sets forth criteria that must be met before per permitting clinical trials of heritable germ germline editing, provides conclusions on the crucial need for public education and engagement, and presents several general principles for the governance of human genome editing. So it's essentially, uh, this is a germline, so from once changes are made, they're carried through uh, from one generation to the next. So lots of uh, challenges in store here. And a few slides on, uh, on omics, regenerative medicine, and innovation. Uh, you may know about uh, uh, 
this graph. We may have an idea of it. Uh, Moore's law is the is the white line that's after Gordon Moore of Intel, the doubling of of uh, computer performance per price every two years or so. Uh, the human genome sequencing uh, tracked it until 2007, uh, and uh, since then it's sort of far, fallen off the table. So when the human genome uh, sequence was completed by uh, and announced by NIH in in uh, 2003. Um, the cost of genome sequencing at that time, human, a, a complete human genome, was uh, something under $100 million. Today, uh, $1,000, and our molecular diagnostics laboratory at the university uh, anticipates that within a couple of years, $500 to $800 for a complete uh, human genome sequence. And this is, a, this is from the Human Genome Project, and uh, a, a very brief video uh, of a minute or so uh, from a special program that was instituted. The scientists who launched the Human Genome Project believed in the power of genetic information to transform healthcare, to allow earlier diagnosis of diseases than ever before possible, and to fuel the creation of powerful new medicines. But it was also clear that genetic information could potentially be used in ways that are hurtful or unfair. For example, denying health insurance because of an increased risk for developing a particular disease. Aware of the danger and hoping to ward it off, the founders of the Human Genome Project created a program to explore the ethical, legal, and social implications of new genetic knowledge. The goal was to anticipate problems that might arise and to prompt solutions. For example, in the future, doctors will likely be able to give each of us a genetic report card that will spell out our risk of developing a variety of different diseases. But will we really want that information? How will it be used? Who will have access to our genetic information? How will it affect our lives, our families, and our communities? The challenge of addressing these issues is not reserved for scientists. We all have a stake in making sure that everyone will benefit from genetic research and no one is harmed. Uh, zooming out from the human genome to a view from space, uh, this, is a, this uh, um, map is from our book, The Biologist's Imagination, which has been circulating, and it was my effort to capture what are called clusters of innovation in the biosciences in different parts of the world. And you'll note uh, Minneapolis is there, St. Paul slash Rochester. I had a feeling when I first made this map in 2006 that Rochester was going to be coming on strong. And I think everything that's, uh, that's happened since uh, bears that out. So these are concentrations, biotech hubs, what have you, where a lot of innovation and entrepreneurship as well as a, sol as well as a, a research infrastructure uh, ma ma makes these areas very important economically as well as in, in health care. And we have Regenerative Minnesota, Medicine Minnesota, uh, that a, a program that was established by the legislature, uh, funding, funded uh, in 2014, uh, and uh, we have uh, um, uh, as part of this program, a, um, uh, a, a, the, a collaboration that builds on a previous collaboration. This collaboration involves the Mayo Clinic, of course, and the University of Minnesota, building on a, uh, an, an additional uh, uh, collaboration launched in 2004, the Minnesota Partnership in Biotechnology and Medical Genomics. And so regenerative medicine is a, is a focus uh, for Minnesota. There's no question about that. Significant investment, certainly in the research, but also in the commercial side, education, and clinical. The uh, 21st Century American Cures Act, passed by Congress last, um, uh, last December, is going to be an important part of uh, building regenerative medicine. And in fact, there are provisions in the American Cures Act uh, that uh, will, will help in the, in the regulation sphere. Uh, to bring these, bring, uh, these uh, advances to uh, fruition. Okay, I'm coming to the last couple slides here. Uh, SpaceX set up uh, some mesenchymal stem cells and other cells. Um, 
and uh, uh, Dr. Abba Zubair at Mayo Clinic Jacksonville uh, wrote me. Uh, these are his cells. We are all excited to look forward to the first uh, set of data beamed down to Earth. Why are they up there? Because it's microgravity, of course, and cells, it is hoped, will grow better in microgravity. Uh, and so we'll, we'll find out the, uh, the um, re result of that in, a fair, in, in fairly short order. Where are we with stem cells? Well, uh, in, in the hemato hematopoietic blood-forming stem cells, stem cell transplants for, for leukemia, lymphoma, multiple myeloma, myelodysplastic syndrome, anemias, we've made a lot of progress. We've learned how to, by and large, how to land the rocket. Uh, uh, that, is that is certainly true of the University of Minnesota and the Mayo Clinic. We're clear leaders in hematopoietic or blood-forming stem cell transplants. We've got a ways to go uh, for other set, uh, stem cell types, mesenchymal stem cells, neural stem cells, uh, what have you. Uh, that we still have uh, a lot of work to do there. This is the uh, proudest piece of our book, The Biologist's Imagination. Uh, and uh, it basically, uh, the, the, uh, I'd like to leave you with this question. Uh, uh, coupled with public anxiety about remarkable and powerful life system technology that I've described, what effect will building walls and retreating from the post-World War II international order have on how and where these technologies are used? They are transform transformational technologies for human and animal health, but also for food and uh, energy production, conservation biology, and helping us understand ecosystem dynamics. They will leave their mark in life code, DNA, genetic imprints of our own making in what some geologists and ecologists are calling the Anthropocene or the human age. Thank you very much. I'd be happy, I'd be happy to answer que any question you have, uh, at least try. <laughs> yes? This work is being done, and I'm, my guess is that we ha there are researchers both at Mayo and at the university who are working in this area. I do not know uh, specifically, uh, so I, c I can't answer your question. I can tell you that uh, macular degeneration is the leading area for therapies uh, using pluripotent stem cells, either human embryonic stem cells or or induce pluripotent reprogrammed cells. Why? Because in, in both cases, certainly in the human, case of human embryonic stem cells, uh, when you stimulate uh, human embryonic stem cells, they, go, they may go down different, different tissue differentiation pathways, but they love to go to eye tissue. And we're talking about retinal epithelial cells here that are destroyed as a result of macular degeneration. So you've got, you've got an advantage in, this, in, the way, in the sense that cells want to go that direction Plus, there's immunoprivilege. Uh, that is to say, you don't have the level of rejection of foreign tissue in your eye. So if you have a donor, donor tissue, whether you weren't going to have your own tissue, donor tissue tends, to, because it's the eye, the eye tends not to reject foreign tissue. That's a big advantage. Uh, this, is the area, this is the leading area for pluripotent stem cell therapy, I think it's fair to say. Uh, that is uh, also one of the diseases that is being that is in currently in clinical trials has been for three or four years now, and that's not that that's related to the the again eye diseases. This is an this is the most promising area so far, and we uh, reached cer certain levels in clinical trials that uh, suggest that that's that there's reason to hope for success there. Big pardon? Uh, That's right. You know, this is a. I, I'm aware of that. It's a mitochondrial disease. Uh, this is a, this is a, this occurred uh, in England, uh, and the uh, the uh, I'll probably get it wrong. So it might be just as well if I don't uh, uh, speculate. But basically, you have uh, uh, a, a mitochondrial disease, and the idea is then to find a way to produce a child. Of course, mitochondria uh, genes pass through the maternal line. Uh, so uh, uh, the idea was to find a way to, to, to uh, produce a healthy child that lacks the mother's 
mitochondria. So this involved two women and a man, as I understand it. <laughs> All right. Uh, I think I, I think that's generally what, and and uh, that that uh, 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 that experiment has been approved in in the UK. I don't know uh, what the status is beyond that. Yes. To, to to take them, is there any way to take stem cells nutritionally? Right. No, uh, no, I mean, we take uh, stem cells uh, are have no uh, distinction from any other cells that you would, uh, if you nip your cuticles, as, as I do, <laughs> it's, just, you know, I, I, I don't think that that is, a, 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 there's any advantage to that. Uh, uh, you have to, ev everything we eat uh, has, you know, food has DNA and we break it down all the time. So, uh, so uh, there's, no, there's no nutritional value in stem cell that I'm aware of. Yes. How is this steam therapy in the treatment of ALS and myopathies? Okay. ALS and myopathies. Uh, I can, I, you know, I, I can say that ALS is a focus uh, of stem cell research for the obvious reasons. ALS is a condition of failure of motor neurons in the spine and in the brain, uh, and uh, um, uh, it is a devastating progressive disease. Uh, if if it if the progression can't be reversed, at least the, the idea is can it be slowed uh, with, with stem cell uh, uh, treatments. And that, you know, they're, they're working on it. Um, uh, what I know that, uh, among other things, they've taken adult tissue, fibroblast skin, from ALS patients, and they have reprogrammed the cells so they become induced pluripotent stem cells and then sent them down the differentiation pathway to become motor neurons in, you know, from, the, from the patient. So they're trying to track, uh, uh, they're trying to model disease, the disease from the patient. From a research standpoint, it's quite uh, interesting to do. Uh, producing therapies from it, though, is still a huge challenge. Uh, so that, the, but that is, uh, I know that, that Mayo has a program uh, on, on uh, uh, concerning ALS and stem cell, uh, and, but I don't know the, the specifics. Yes. What is the difference between? And HeLa cells. Okay. Uh, okay. HeLa cells uh, made famous by the, by the uh, book uh, about Henrietta Lacks, HeLa, and I remember those HeLa cells when I was used to work with a fellow who studied chromosomes. Never knew what HeLa meant until I read the book. Um, HeLa cells are cell are cancer cells that have been made essentially immortal. Uh, mesenchymal cells, which is the uh, at least one of the cell lines that that. Uh, that was sent up into space. They, these are not immortal cells. They, uh, uh, they, they, they'll have a limited uh, number of, uh, of cell divisions. Uh, so, so they're one. One is a cancer cell line for for research purposes. Mesenchymal cells have great potential to regenerate any number of tissues from all three germ layers. That is, say, the ectoderm, which is which in, in gastrulation produces the nervous system and skin the endoderm, which produces a lot of internal organs like the pancreas, and the mesoderm, which is the, uh, the cardiovascular system and, and um, uh, musculoskeletal system. It shows some, some evidence of, of being able to repair in all those areas. But, but uh, you know, we, we'll have to wait and see because these, these, these cells uh, are among the most studied by stem cell researchers and potentially have great therapeutic value. Lots of studies here, but we haven't got to phase three trials except for a handful. Uh, of cases. Yes? Uh, would it be possible to uh, kind of put the mechanism of the HeLa cells to be mortal into like stem cells that way they never want to? <laughs> well, now bear in mind, pluripotent stem cells 
are, uh, at, uh, at least in theory, immortal cells uh, as long as they're fed. But I guess you could say that about, about uh, HeLa cells, too. Uh, you know, uh, it's, 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 not the, it's, so it's not the immortality aspect. It's the, it's the ability to direct uh, uh, cells that can go to any tissue, become any tissue, to direct them down that pathway that you want to, and to become that, you know, a given tissue. Uh, and and uh, we have lots of ways of doing that, but we're not, you know, we still have a long ways to go to be able to take a given a pluripotent stem cell and send it 200 different directions uh, uh, and, and being able to send it uh, with confidence that, that it's going to reach its destination. That's, you know, we, we can do certain things, but we're not there yet. Uh, but in terms of immortality, uh, uh, you know, we have... Uh, Human embryonic stem cells, as long as they're cultured, I assume uh, induce pluripotent stem cells. Pluripotency suggests that uh, that these cells will, uh, as long as they're maintained, will co will continue to divide and and make copies of themselves indefinitely. Yes. Big pardon. Well, stem cell research is ethical. If you're asking about the, the status of the human embryo, uh, that's, that's a little different question. So what's the, 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 what's the moral status of the human embryo? Uh, should embryos be destroyed for research purposes or not? And that's a, that's a, people come down, down on different side there. Uh, what, we, what we know is that embryos are created. Uh, extra embryos are created as a result of... Uh, of uh, in, vi in vitro, excuse me, uh, IVF, in vitro fertilization, as you saw on, on, on the video. So you have all these embryos. Uh, and what is, that, what is the, their status? Well, uh, it depends uh, uh, what your point of view is. I mean, y uh, y there's, there's no one, or very, very few, who would, would argue that they are, as embryos, entitled to person personhood, although that is uh, ha that has been raised in uh, in some states, and and, and uh, there has been uh, there have been some discussion about that, but uh, it's an ongoing ethical question uh, that's very difficult to answer. Uh, uh, the, I take my guidance from uh, certain uh, individuals. One is Michael Sandel, who uh, wrote the book. the case against perfection. Uh, he thinks the idea of going in and altering, say, germline, uh, uh, the human germline, or genetic enhancement of children is wrong because it interferes with the natural gift, their natural giftedness, and there are all, all sorts of deleterious consequences to doing that. He thinks that for uh, human medicine and to ease human suffering is permissible. Uh, so there, you know, it depends on where you, this is an important ethical question. It's less, it's become less uh, uh, heated uh, since the discovery of uh, iPS cells, which really most researchers now use rather than deal with the, uh, with the uh, ethical issues uh, surrounding human, human embryos. But human embryos have been created, created in excess every day. Uh, in Germany, one embryo can be created by in vitro fertilization. No, no surplus embryos. No one that I know of in, in Congress has suggested that maybe we ought to uh, uh, regulate fertility clinics. Okay? So it's a different way of looking at things uh, uh, and a different culture, uh, cultural uh, perspective. Yes? That's a good question too. Uh, I, I was in. T are there any ethical issues concerning IPS cells? These reprogrammed adult cells. Uh, I was in in uh, in a, uh, in um, co correspondence with a uh, with a, a Catholic priest who headed a ethical ethics uh, um, institution in New York about this. He had taken into counsel a number of uh, leading biomedic researchers. Uh, and and he concluded that the the uh, uh, discovery of IVF excuse me of IPS cells 
obviated the whole issue of uh, human embryonic stem cell research. I disagreed. I said, if you, if you have pluripotent stem cells, and you, if you have the capability, it's, it's possible to imagine that human sperm and eggs could be made from those pluripotent cells. Uh, he didn't think that was a likelihood, and within a year they were doing it in mice. Uh, it, they were taking a, a, you know, a, a mature differentiated cells from mice, creating gametes, and creating individuals in, in the uh, individual organisms, uh, individual mice. So uh, they, they had some other tricks to make it happen. But I didn't, I, if, if a cell is pluripotent, but then, then I don't think that the, the, the ethical question goes away entirely. All right. Thank you. Most welcome.